Hey, my buddy, Swanson, full steam ahead, over there. I want to go over there. I'll move over, Swanson, I'm driving. Wow, wow. <laughs> Alrighty, a big, giant, hippopotamus-sized thank you to the lovely and talented Mr. Mark Gilbert, who recorded that amazing and non-copyright infringing version of this show's theme. What you heard just before that was the yacht scene from Caddyshack, and the reason why you heard that is because if you listen to the music in the background, you will hear a tune from my next guest today. Hilly, a.k.a. Hilly Boy Michaels, is a multi-instrumentalist with tons of creds to his name. Sparks fans know him best for the thunderous drumming on 1976 Big Beat, which was a massive part of the sound of that album. A few years later, in 1980, Hilly finally stepped forward as a singing, songwriting, solo artist, recording his own album on Capitol Records, Calling All Girls, which was produced by Roy Thomas Baker of Queen and, uh, and the Cars. Uh, Something on Your Mind, which uh, is the song that you heard on Caddyshack, uh, was uh, on Caddyshack. At the time, uh, his manager, Jane Hooker, also got Hilly a million-dollar deal with Warner Brothers Records, and he orchestrated the deal for the first big-budget MTV-style video to promote Hilly's single, Calling All Girls. It was a landmark breakthrough video in the industry. Calling All Girls video was all over MTV back in the days when MTV's programmers didn't have a whole lot to choose from and were occasionally forced to show decent material. That quote is not for me, by the way. One year later, Hilly Michaels released a follow-up album called Lumia. Uh, After that, Hilly went back to session recordings. In 1982, he played drums with a short-lived group he was in, which also featured Mick Ronson on guitar and Les Franklin on bass. In addition to those guys... And Sparks, he has played with tons of people, including Ian Hunter from Mott the Hoople, G. E. Smith from the Saturday Night Live Band, Stevie Wonder, Lindsey Buckingham, Ellen Foley, Cherry Vanilla, Neil Young, David Sanborn, Michael Bolton. I can go on and on and on. I really literally could, but I won't. Um, Hilly's most recent album is 2010's Pop This. He says he is working on new material. By way of a mutual acquaintance, Tom Ferranti, Hilly and I got to chatting in March of 2021. We hit it off, and as you will hear, we had a lot to say, or maybe I just had a lot to ask. Uh, so it's a lengthy interview. I considered going and editing it, but I figure, you know, I'm lazy. This episode, by the way, starts a few minutes into our interview, so consider this your intro. All right, enough out of me. Here is Hilly Boy Michaels. Uh, me and several other uh, music fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, actually, let me back that up. My sister, uh, rest in peace, it was uh, four years older than me. And from and she was an amazing musical influence on me how so because she would bring home stacks of records and put them on our victrola <laughs> <laughs> yeah the victrola and they were all the killer hits from right. the fifties and sixties, but uh, lots of Motown, uh, lots of pop. So Cheryl was uh, a sister. huge influence on my life. Thank God, yeah, because there was always music in the house, and uh, in this. When I was in the sixth grade, there was a general assembly called. Mm -hmm. 
and we all went to the uh, assembly room and up on stage were four of my classmates hmm. and they kicked off doing about a half a dozen Beatle tunes <laughs> and I was in the audience and I was staring at the drummer who I knew. Okay. And I just thought it was a bomb, a gas. And I was just laughing and laughing and laughing. It was so fun. Now, were you turned? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I looked at the drummer. Yeah. And I said, I could do that. Yeah. So that was, uh, music-wise, instrument-wise, that was your first love, was the drums. Like, that's what you, you, you know, you felt like that was going to be your thing, right? Well, my mom and dad went to the Bahamas when I was uh, like eight, nine years old. And they brought back uh, bongos. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bahamian bongos. <laughs> and what I would do is take two brand new pencils with fresh eraser tips and put them between my legs and start doing rudiments. Okay. And that's how I began drumming, <laughs> using bongos and pencils. So, and I would pl- play along to music. i put a record on, and I would uh, parrot the, the beat. Right. So, I mean, from a very early time in your life you know you were like oh this is this is what i want to focus on like i'm going to do drums if you're going to do anything musical it was the 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 drums the rhythm that really spoke to you is yeah right? the backbeat right 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 back so who the were nuts and bolts right so uh who were some of your early uh musical uh influences during that time you know when you were a young kid okay that's a fair question. Uh, Sandy Nelson had a record called mm-hmm. Let There Be Drums. Yes. And I used to listen to that time after time after time over and over and over again every day, <laughs> 10, 20 times a day. Yeah. And then I began listening to Louis Belson, mm-hmm. who I loved. He had this one amazing groove. It was like one and two and three and a four. Do 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 now, so when you started playing on your own, did that kind of just come naturally to you? Yeah, here's here's what happened. After seeing uh, the band, mm-hmm. uh, a couple of other friends of mine got guitars. And uh, when I turned 13, I met a, uh, a guy called uh, Gary, the Gar, mm-hmm. Gary Barnett. And we met on a uh, school bus. Yeah. I went to a a, a, a private uh, school called Cheshire Academy. And this was and in Connecticut? Just, yeah, hmm. a very prestigious uh, kind of uh, school, right. you know, with like five, six, seven kids in a class in a classroom right sitting around a table i mean it was like going to college yeah you know it was just so intense and gary and i started uh becoming friends and he told me he played guitar and i said uh i'd love to to you know uh get some drums 
And I begged my mother and father to buy me a drum set. Hmm. And they were hedging and hedging and hedging. And they said, nah, yeah, I don't know about a drum set. <laughs> and here's what we'll do. We'll start you off with a cymbal and a snare drum. So you started with just a snare and a cymbal. That, yes. That's what you had. Okay. And then they broke down and bought me a, a kick drum. Yeah. And a hi-hat. And that's all I had. Right. Was a kick, a snare, <laughs> a hi-hat, and a ride cymbal. So were so, I was just going to ask you, so were they pretty supportive, you know, of your, your interests? I mean, you know, like when when you're a kid who wants to drum, that makes a lot of noise. I think that they found it amusing. Yeah. And, uh, now Gary was, he was like, uh, born with a a God given talent Mm. to play guitar Mm. And he would be able to make his guitar sound like an entire band. Wow. He could play rhythm and play the lead while he's playing rhythm. He was just amazing. And his right arm was like a locomotion (laughs) thing, driving a train. And he he would come over to, to my house just about every day that we weren't going to school. So it was weekends and then a summer of every single day, Gary Barnett and myself with my very stripped down kit would hammer out these songs, Mm -hmm. the hits, of the past year or two, I fought the law. Yeah. Uh, the classics. Now, did and you guys uh, play uh, live anywhere? Did you do any performances at, at, well, at any point? Well, it did grow, but uh, for about four months, it was just me and Gary. Mm-hmm. And he knew every song. His timing was impeccable. Mm. And, uh, we branched out. Oh, this is important. Yeah. Christian. (laughs) He was savvy enough to bring over a reel to reel quarter inch tape recorder. And we would record two to three hours of us playing. And then we would sit there and play it back. Hmm. Now, I can't tell you how important that is, you know, in terms of objectivity. Right. You you play, and then you're out of the moment. Mm-hmm. Rewind the tape and hit play and listen to an hour or two yeah. of you playing. And I heard what I should do right, what I what what I was doing great, what I wasn't supposed to do. Oh, that's how to do a double kick. Right, right. And uh, that was the greatest learning tool for me. And I would, I would advise any musician starting out to record immediately Mm -hmm. everything you do and then Mm -hmm. sit back and play it back once, twice, three times. So you could listen and be objective. That was the most important thing. If, Mm -hmm. if we didn't have a tape recorder, Mm -hmm. I, I I don't think I would have gotten as good as I ended up getting. And it was all because we we had a taper recorder. Right. So uh, 
then uh, a couple of friends, mutual uh, school friends mm -hmm. of ours, uh, decided uh, we wanted to to start a band, mm. which we did, a cover band. And I was only 13, 14 years old. Yeah. And w we would rehearse every day, every night, and play gigs. Now, where were, where were you at this point? Were you still in Connecticut, or had you moved to yeah, California? Yeah, still in Connecticut, Connecticut yeah. in New Haven. Yeah. And uh, we were playing. We were good. We were really good. <laughs> we were we were a great cover band. And uh, I remember when I was like 14 years old opening up for the Vanilla Fudge. Really? At 14? Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we had this uh, cover band and we were getting booked all over. Uh, right. We, uh, we, we didn't worry from uh, not having gigs to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, we had, we had this band and we, it was called the coconut conspiracy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sure. And the people in the band was Mark Friedland uh -huh. and, uh, myself, Gary Barnett, uh -huh. Bobby Goodman, and, um, uh, I can't remember yeah. the other guy or two. Have you been in uh, uh, contact with those guys uh, recently? Uh, yes. One of them, Mark. Yeah. He's a multi-instrumentalist -inst <laughs> living in Colorado. Gotcha. And he plays rhythm. Mm -hmm. He plays lead. He plays piano. He plays synth. He, yeah. he plays incredible bass and he plays a pedal steel so that's also one thing i wanted to uh talk to you about because you're 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 known as a drummer right but but you play other instruments as well so i mean do you think of yourself primarily as a drummer no, no. not at all not at all so how did you I, I, learn all those other instruments? Because I mean, like I, I'm I'm a guy who can barely barely play guitar and bass, right? You know, but I mean, you you seem to be a jack of all trades. So it sounds like you picked up the drums first. So when did you get into the other instruments? Okay, so when I was fifteen, I asked Mark. I said, Mark, show me how, teach me how to play guitar. Yeah. And he showed me a major position and he said, now use the same uh, finger structure mm -hmm. and go up. And then he showed me how to turn that into a minor. Okay. Okay. And he said, just keep doing that over and right. over and over major, major up right. and down the neck and minor major to minor, minor to major, and I began to have a sense and, of, wow, right. I could play guitar now. <laughs> yeah. Then I, I began hearing melodies in my head. Yeah. And in the sixth grade, <laughs> I Still wrote... Still in the sixth grade. <laughs> yeah. I, I wrote some original music and me and two other guys in front of our classroom got up in front of the blackboard yeah. and played my original music I had written. Oh, wow. And the, the room loved it. The kids uh -huh. really loved it. So, uh, 
Also, mm -hmm. when I was 15, Christian, I got a gig working at a record store. Mm. And I was in charge of the singles department of the largest record store in New Haven or, yeah. uh, you know, so what, 30 what, mile radius. What did you New get Haven. out of that? What did I get out of it? Yeah. Well, I got to, I got a chance to go through piles and piles and piles of 45s <laughs> and A&R guys would uh, come in from New York and drop off batches Are you, of records. Really? A&R guys would me. just come by and drop off records? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So Yeah. You, and they would say, yeah. Mike, do, do us a favor. Somebody from Capitol or RCA. Yeah. Play the play these <laughs> songs all day while you're working, mm, mm. and uh, I got turned on to so much bizarre music and like cutting what? edge music and stuff people never heard about. Can you give me any examples from that time? Yeah, the. The Bubble Puppy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The Bubble Puppy. I'll have to look that one up. Okay, Bubble Puppy. Hot Smoking Sassafras, right? Hot Smoking Sassafras. Oh, boy. I got to Google all Ted this. Nugent. <laughs> What's that? I think Ted Nugent, Ted Nugent was in. I think so. Yeah. But Bubble Puppy uh, <laughs> was one. And um, as as the band grew. Yeah. I began, I quit, I quit working at the, uh, record uh, store right. and I, I, I started going to the album yeah. shop, hmm. which was the same name of the record store. Yeah. But now I was picking out all kinds of bizarre <laughs> records. Can and I remember I, I discovered uh, Andy Warhol's first record. Oh, my God. Like, I did, didn't even realize Andy Warhol made a record. Well, wow. The Velvet Underground. Okay, sure, yeah. I picked that up, and I played it. At home, and then I brought it over to uh, 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 Michael Bolton's manager's <sighs> house, who was gotcha. four. He, he had a clique of friends. They were like four years older yeah. than, than I was. And uh, we had a rehearsal basement, mm -hmm. and I would bring records over like Country Joe and the Fish. Mm -hmm. Frank Zappa, Mothers of Invention, <laughs> Freak Out, uh, The Velvet Underground, yeah. and turn these much older uh, music savvy musicians onto music mm -hmm. they would have never heard had it not been for me. Wow. So, I I think it's fair fair to say that I mean at, at this point when you're when you were working at the record store you were what like fifteen sixteen had you decided at this point that yeah I'm gonna be a musician my career is gonna be in music is that when that happened for you yeah yeah Michael Bolton yeah uh, at the time was was his real name is Bolotin. Oh, B -O -L -O -T -I, -N. I didn't know that. I was going to ask you about that as well. How, how was that association with, with, with Michael Bolton? He was, we all knew in New Haven, oh. everyone in New Haven knew that Michael had been kissed by God uh -huh. because his voice, uh -huh. when he was 15 years old, mm -hmm. Sounded like Joe Cocker, 
and Rod Stewart. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> now, he lived uh, near you in, in Connecticut? I didn't know that. Connecticut. Huh, okay. Didn't know that. Wow. He, he, he put a psychedelic pop band together, mm -hmm. and Michael played rhythm guitar. His, mm. his hair was like down to his back, <laughs> and he wore granny glasses, <laughs> and his hair parted down the middle, and he had a killer drummer called Bob Brockway. Uh -huh. I mean, this guy would just break cymbals and break drums, <laughs> but he, he had such a profound, such a profound impact mm -hmm. on me. Great. So, I, I how so? How, uh, how did he affect I your... Would listen. I, I would sit by every gig. Mm -hmm. I would sit by Bob when he was playing with Michael. Mm -hmm. And Michael was doing a set of his, his uh, original music. Yeah. And I was, I was just bedazzled. This guy... Bob Rockway, mm -hmm. he sound, he was like John Bottom. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Big words. Yeah. Okay. And he would crack cymbals and he would borrow my drums and smash the heads, smash my mm. cymbals and <laughs> but I paid close attention to, to Brockway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um uh, Bob left, and I took his place. Yeah. Michael got signed to uh, R RCA mm -hmm. when he was 15. Wow. His mother had to sign for him. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and uh, the band, his band called Joy, mm -hmm. released two singles. Mm -hmm. One called uh, one song called the the Bapa song, <laughs> written by Michael, okay. and another song called Back to New Haven. Mm. Gotcha. And uh, so Michael had a record deal when he was fifteen, and yeah. I was the uh, replacement drummer for Brockway. Right. And. Uh, I remember we, we were playing all over New Haven. No, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Hilly. Did, so, did did you uh, uh, were you involved in any recordings with Michael Bolton during during that time, or no, no, okay, Just no live shows, with the exception of playing bongos <laughs> in a room. <laughs> With my my fingers and hands uh -huh. <laughs> playing my bongos like a tabla, yeah, an Indian tabla oh, drummer, yeah. and it, Michael had three songs, mm. and Michael played guitar, I played the bongos, mm. and this guy Glenn mm. Zellwitz played bass. And another dude called Fred Bova played guitar. We demoed three songs in Michael's bedroom, uh -huh. and they sounded magical. <laughs> and the bongos, yeah. I mean, the rhythm of uh, the, that, that batch of music, mm -hmm. the backbeat, it was like butterflies. It was amazing, just amazing. Mm. Uh, Michael's manager, Ribs, uh, was in L.A. at the time. We sent him the tape, mm -hmm. and he called us up, and he said, I got us a record deal. So did you like working with like, Michael? What, did, did what? Did you like working with Michael? Was Michael Bolton? Loved it. Yeah. He was a good guy. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I look, uh, I, I had ears. I knew that, that Michael was, was going to be a monster hit yeah, yeah. Yeah. at some point. Yeah. 
And the smartest thing I should do is to stick with Michael, go to L.A. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we sign with a a label called Pentagram Records. Mm -hmm. And we recorded at Sound City Mm -hmm. in Van Nuys, California. One of the most famous recording studios in the world. Okay. So Ever heard of it? Oh yeah, I, I yeah, I've heard about yeah, Van Nuys. So And we Go ahead. We were sharing the studio with artists like uh 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 Dr. John. Wow. Uh, uh amazing. Yeah. Uh people were also recording. We, our producer, his, his name is Michael Z. Gort. Uh, he cut about six tracks of us, mm-hmm. seven, mm-hmm. and they were amazing. <laughs> they were amazing. And uh, no sooner did we sign and record. Mm-hmm. The record company folded, uh, went bankrupt. So I'm timing. out there with uh, Fred and Glenn, and we're freelancing. Yeah. And I meet Larry Norman from the group The People. Hmm. They had a top ten record called "I Love You." Okay. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. One. And. Uh, We met him on Sunset Strip, Mm -hmm. and it was me, Glenn, Fred, and Larry Norman Mm -hmm. wanted to use us as his backing band, Mm -hmm. and we ended up using Pat Boone's studio, (laughs) and it was Christian rock and roll music. (laughs) Pat Boone. That's great. And we ended up doing a double bootleg record. (laughs) And it is, they were all one takers. Oh, yeah. Larry would play about half the song Mm -hmm. on the piano and just say, follow along. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we did about 15 songs. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, at that time, I met uh, at uh, Sound City. Mm-hmm. I met these guys signed to RCA Records, who mm-hmm. sounded like the Beatles. Who were and they? the Ever- Everly Brothers combined? Mm-hmm. They were called Peach and Lee. Mm-hmm. They had a record deal on RCA. They didn't. They did not have a drummer. Oh. Mm-hmm. They talked me into to uh, joining the band to go to New York, cut the record, and uh, be uh, you know famous. <laughs> <laughs> so go. I remember so, so we, clearly knocking on Michael's apartment door. Michael Bolton, say, Mike. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I said, Michael, listen. You know those guys, Peach and Lee. Uh, who, who Michael Z. Gordon is producing. Yeah. Uh, they're signed to, to Michael, those, <laughs> those Beatle guys. Yeah. He goes, yeah. He <laughs> said, I said, I'm going to New York with them. I'm joining the band. I quit. Oh, okay. And Michael gotcha. said, no, Hilly, don't go. Yeah. Don't quit. <laughs> Please, don't go. Don't go. I said, right. <laughs> It's a done deal. I'm Thanks. sorry because I got on so great with Larry Lee yeah. and Arliss Peach. Arliss Peach and Larry Lee mm. and Hilly Michaels flew mm. to New York mm-hmm. and we tracked an A side and a B side called Hold On. And the B side uh, mm. was a Beatles obscure Beatles cover but called uh, It's For You. Don't know know that one. uh, 
Yeah, yeah. If you if someone wants to dig, <laughs> I got to look the for the name of the band. What is Peach and Lee? Right. And the A side was was Arliss and Larry's co-write called Hold On, and the B side was a Lennon McCartney hmm. song called It's for You. No, yeah. It's right for you. So, Hilly, I'm going to no, skip sorry. ahead. What the, was that? The B-side, you get to edit this. The B-side sure. is called It's Better. Okay, by It's the Better. Beatles. Gotcha. All right. So, Hilly, I'm going to skip ahead a bit here. I know okay. that you are. I'm, we're going to talk about Sparks now. So, I, I know you were a very early fan of Sparks. So, I, I'd, I'd like to know, how did you first hear sparks and you know like what was your reaction well we cut the record in new york and then i say now what 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 do we do now Wait, are and you Arliss talking about Larry, uh, do you mean big beat arliss and larry lived oh. in omaha uh -huh. nebraska yeah. in council bluffs iowa which are Right on the border, they were. They live five minutes yep. from one another, and they said, "Come out to the Midwest, okay, and let's see what happens if our if our record breaks." So I fly out and move to Omaha. Yeah, we're driving along one night oh. in the car, four or five of us. Yeah, and it's real late and dark, and. Yeah, we're play Larry's playing with the radio, and all of a sudden I hear Wonder Girl, and I go, "Stop! Ha. Stop! Don't yeah. touch the dial! Ha. Turn that up!" That was like a big aha moment he hearing Wonder that Girl. That was like an epiphany, <laughs> and wow. I was totally. Where were you then? Where, where were you? I'm sorry. I was in a car. Yeah, but uh, geographically. Uh huh. Like where? What? Like what city? What state? Omaha. You're in. Oh yeah. Okay. Omaha, and you heard Wonder Girl. So Wonder Girl was being played on the radio in Omaha. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I insisted. Turn it up. Yeah. Turn it up. Yeah. Don't yeah. effing change that. <laughs> Turn it up. What station is that? Yeah. And I got the station information. And I called the radio station the yeah. following day. Yeah. And I said, at 845, you played something uh, by a band called Spark, mm. Wonder Girl. Mm -hmm. And he goes, yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, he didn't say Sparks. Mm. I said, you played uh, a song called Wonder Girl. And he goes, yeah. 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 Uh, by Half Nelson. Oh, right. Yeah. They, they were Half Nelson at that time, I guess. Or, or had been. Yeah. It just lingered in my head. I yeah. didn't rush out and buy it. Right. But it just always lingered yeah. and lingered and lingered year after year yeah. after year. I would think about uh, Har Harvey's drum beat to that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah he did. Yeah he did a great How, job, Harley. Yeah, he, it sounded yeah. like it was out of sync almost. <laughs> yeah, With the kick and snare. I said that is cool. It was cool, and a stripped down production. Yeah, and uh, kind of Beatleish. Yeah, sounding and Ronnie tinkling away. Oh, Russell's yeah. really high. Oh, he was he, all in the falsetto. He, he and, vocal. Yeah, I fell in love with the band right yeah. then that night. So it, it, uh, you know, so you know, years after that, a few years after that, obviously, you know, you were uh, roommates with Mick Ronson, right? And that's when you actually met Ron and Russ. Uh, that sounds like a crazy situation. First of all, you're rooming with Mick Ronson. How did that happen? And secondly, you got, you know, uh, Ron and Russ coming by to jam. How did that happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was playing with Cherry Vanilla. Uh-huh. 
at the time. Yeah. And we, uh, she put uh, her first rock and roll, uh, rock and roll band together. Mm. And Mick dropped by one night and came backstage and was making fun of how much makeup I had on. <laughs> and he said, fucking hell, Hilly. <laughs> He said, I never even wore that much makeup when I was with Bowie. Oh, my God. I read that somewhere. He says, yeah. he, he says you got to lighten up, <laughs> mate, on the eyeliner. It's <laughs> dripping down your face. So the and glam said, thing was still <laughs> with you. <laughs> and, and he says to me, you played fucking amazing, uh -huh. man. Yeah. He said, he said, Fuck Ainsley Dunbar. <laughs> he said, I'd love for you to be my drummer. Oh, wow. And I said, really? Wow. I, I could, it, when I was in, living in Hollywood yeah. years before, you know, I would see, you know, billboards of mm. uh, Mick's face yeah. all over, up and down the mm. strip. And, uh, you know, I was a huge Bowie fan, yeah. but an even bigger Mick Ronson fan. Yeah. I love the way he played guitar. So, uh, so why after, do you think that you guys never, like you and Mick, like you never, uh, you know, joined forces together? Well, I went over to his brownstone mm -hmm. and, uh, he knew I was coming over. I, I, and he said, uh, yeah, definitely come over. Right. And, uh, he said, you know, I have a full rehearsal room and, you know, three other floors just live here with us. Cool. Me, Susie, my wife and my, my roommate, Danny. Cool. And I said, I'd love to. And, uh, I just moved in, moved, and slept on the couch, yeah. and then there was an attic, and uh -huh. I lived in the attic, and me and Mick uh -huh. would go down to uh, the rehearsal room and just bang out songs uh, and write wow. music together. That must have been like a dream come true. Out. Oh, wow. We, would, we, we had some kind of connection, yeah. me and yeah. Mick. We loved each, each uh, other's company. Wait. You know, and it was it, because it, of Mick. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it was it was because of Mick that Ron and Russ came by one day. Am I right? Right, six seven months into, yeah. uh, or it could have been a year, mm. uh, trying to uh, find uh, the missing members of the Mick Ronson band right. at nights. <laughs> we, we would scour the the uh the new york night clubs mm -hmm. and try to find uh uh members yeah. for the mick ronson band right so me and mick would go out and check out guitarists yeah. bass guitarists rhythm guitarists hire uh 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 you know a real upscale rehearsal yeah. uh space and uh we did that for almost a year mm -hmm. and uh all of a sudden mm -hmm. one afternoon mm -hmm. danny shea mm -hmm. makes uh official roommate yeah who is covering the rent uh, -huh. uh yelled upstairs to, or downstairs to make he yelled <laughs> Hey, Ronson, those Sparks guys are here for you. Just out of nowhere, huh? Okay. Yeah. Right. And So what, what was that like, Ron and Russ just showing up at the door? Well, it was Ron and Russell with Sal Maida. A Sal Maida. And, yeah. and uh, their, their manage, manager, uh, uh, Joseph Flurry. Flurry, right. Gotcha. And... Uh, we sat around and we just talked and they asked Mick, would you be interested in producing uh, our next LP? So they we asked, just signed, 
I'm sorry. The, huh? So they asked Mick if he would produce. Is that? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. All right. And huh. Now, I had, uh, a year or two before, mm-hmm. I had seen Sparks on TV mm. and went out and bought their back catalog. Yeah. You know, come on to my house, propaganda yeah. and discreet yeah. and play it over and over and over. And I just loved them. Yeah. And I saw them on TV yeah. and I said, this is the uh, kind of band I want to be. That must have just blown your with. mind that they showed up at the place where you were living and they were like, well, Hey, let's, 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 let's jam. Two of my, th- three of my, all-time heroes. Yeah. I got to play with three of my all, my <sighs> three top heroes, yeah. which is yeah. Mick Ronson, Sparks, yeah. and Michael Ron Brown and, okay, from yeah. the left bank. What was that like when Ron and Russ were like, hey, yo, uh, uh, Mick and also you, Hilly, let's all jam together. And you're all jamming together. I assume you did that in the, the Brownstone. Uh, I, maybe yeah, about that. we Whoa. go into the rehearsal room. Uh, oh, rehearsal room, okay. Uh, yeah, was yeah. That, how, uh, what was that like? Did that surprise you? I was uh, just walking on on air. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm like following Ron and Ru- or f- following Mick. Yeah, and Ron and Russell are behind me, and I'm yeah. thinking to myself, I gotta be dreaming. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is like a dream come yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a baby grand. Yes, in the room. Uh huh. A set of drums. Yeah. Mix uh, amp and orange amp, uh-huh. and Sal plugs into uh, some kind of huge bass. So Sal's already uh, with you guys. Are, are, are you talking about the recordings for, for Big Beat now? I'm talking about the very first time hmm. I okay. ever played with and met yeah. Spark. You guys already had Sal? No. Oh. Sal arrived with Ron and Russell. Ah. Okay, gotcha. And we said, let's see what we sound like. And <laughs> Mick, we want you to hear our music oh, that man. we plan on uh, recording for yeah. uh, Columbia. Right, right. In a couple of weeks. Hmm. And they, they had no idea how, how I sounded. Yeah. They, they, they knew how, Sa- how Sal Meda sounded. Yeah, because he how, was how with he Roxy played. Music for a while, right? That, that's correct. Yeah. And uh, so Ronnie starts banging out a song, showing Mick the chords. Mm. And it was uh, Big Boy. Yeah. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding, 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 yeah, ding, ding, yeah. ding. And Mick, yeah, and Mick mm. just turns up the 13 <laughs> and strikes this big chord. And I come, I come, I come in on the one mm-hmm. with a mm-hmm. crash mm-hmm. and that halftime do 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 bap yep. do do do, yep. yep. And I, I, I just thought that I should treat it, treat it like I was Keith Moon or, or something. <laughs> yeah, right. And we got through the song. Yeah. And we all looked at one another. We all had tape recorders mm. going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was amazing. We listened back to it and we all looked at one another. Yeah. I have those and recordings, Ron- by the way. <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. And then we did another song. Yeah. So uh, uh, I, I'm just curious. Did, did, uh, did Ron and Russ like, ask you to play in a certain way? I mean, I know that they had their own songs that they presented to you. Did they give you any sort of direction on what they wanted you to do on the drums? Or did they just, you know, kind of say, hey, do your thing? Well, not not necessarily the first time with mm. Mick. Yeah. Uh, as it turned out, uh, we, we, played, we played like five, six tunes with Mick and... At, when they left, I said, Mick, we don't have to look for players anymore. Oh, right. 
you know, right. Right. The, the, you know, we'll hook up with Spark. Yeah. Yeah. Mix it. Yeah. You know, I don't know about yeah. that. I don't know. We'll yeah. see. So but, I wanted to ask you about that. So what what was up with that? Because I I know that uh, that Sparks had asked uh, Mick to join with them. Yes, uh, and and they he didn't go join. for it. So what what happened there? Well, uh, it sounded so awesome. Yeah. A few days later, I get. A, I'm I'm looking at Mick and Mick is pacing around the room and I go, "What's up, man?" Yeah, and he said, "I got a phone call from uh, Sparks Management. Yeah. I'm not going to be producing the band." Hmm. I said, "Why?" He said, "Because uh, if I produce it and play on it, yeah. there's they're not going to." They're not going to be able to find anyone that's going to play like me. Mm -hmm. So it's like Mm -hmm. if I produce and play, Mm -hmm. it's almost like I have Mm -hmm. to be in the band. Mick was not in the mood to join any band. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. His phone was ringing off the oh, hook. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure. So you guys, so, yeah, go ahead. I get a phone call. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's a shame. I'm not, I'm not going to play with with the uh, Sparks now. And, oh, you uh, thought you I weren't going to stay with Sparks because what? because Mick was out. You thought you weren't going to have a spot. Well, uh, once Mick gave me that information mm-hmm. I I thought to myself well it looks like you know if Mick isn't doing it I'm mm. not, I'm not mm. gonna throw Mick under the bus sure sure and, and uh, abandon him sure after looking uh, for players for a year year and a half and uh I get a phone call from uh, England, mm. John John Hewlett. Hewlett, yeah. Mm. From uh, John's children. Yeah. yeah. Sparks uh, Management calls me. Right. And he said, listen, Haley, you, Mick, and Ron and Russell and Sal, yeah. uh, Ron and Russell want you to be their drummer. Ah, oh, God, what a moment that must have been. And I said, really? <laughs> Man. Yeah. What a, yeah. What a moment. We're, we're, yeah, we're, 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 we're going to record the record yeah. in a few weeks. And Rupert Holmes yes. is going to produce it. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that's the next thing I wanted to ask you about was what was that like? What was it like? Of being in the studio and having Rupert Holmes produce you guys. What was that experience like for you? Well, I knew of Rupert Holmes. Hmm. Uh, I was actually kind of like a fan uh-huh. of Rupert. When I was working at the record shop when I was 15, yeah. Rupert had a semi hit called, uh, um, uh, <laughs> tri- these guys, uh, Timothy. Okay. I was going to say, it's not Pina Timothy. Colada. Yeah. yeah. About these guys trapped in a mine mm. and they go cannibal on one another. And the chorus wow. breaks out into Timothy, <laughs> Timothy, <laughs> where on earth did you go? <laughs> they ate Timothy. That's kind of intense. In, in the mine. So, you know, it's right up my alley. Yeah. And, so was Spark. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. that tongue in the cheek yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, John said, look, you know, we want you to join the band. Yeah, yeah. Ron Heal Russell it. really yeah. loves your playing. Right. I right. said, well, I, I'm not quitting Mick's uh, band. So you were uh, in a band with Mick at that time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, I was home and I said, listen, John, 
I, you know, I'm really happy to get the offer, but mm, I, mm, I'm not going to mm. leave Mick. Yeah, right. you know, but uh, we're like best friends. <laughs> sure. And uh, and John said, "Look, Hilly, how much mm. money are you making a week?" Mm. Up next. I got lots of money. I got lots of time. Bought myself a penthouse. Filled it up with bubbly wine. Flying out anywhere. He says, "Why don't you join? <laughs> Let me give you a suggestion. Suggestion: <laughs> Join an amazing pop band yeah. who's yeah. known all over Europe. Mm-hmm. That has an, an amazing fan base. Yes. And he said, Do you want thousands of of teenage girls screaming <laughs> for you and ripping your Where clothes <laughs> off.'" And here's what we'll uh, pay you a week. Yeah. And I said, let me think about that. It probably took you two and seconds. Yeah. I went to Mix yeah. the following day, and I told him about the call, and he said, Hilly, do it. Good, cool. Don't worry about me. <laughs> Don't worry about the Mick Ronson man. He said, I'll be fine. I want you to join Spark. Oh, man, that's great. Okay. I said, yeah. You, you you wouldn't feel like I was like abandoning you or anything like mm. that. Yeah. Because, you know, I was like so loyal yeah. to Mick. I loved him. Yeah. I, I totally loved Mick. Yeah. And I think vice versa. And he said, no, it'll be good for you. It's, he said, you've never done like a major 
act and uh, it's very uh, done a major tour. He said, go do it and see what happens. He said, maybe in six months or or a year. Mm -hmm. He said, we'll pick it up again. Yeah, sure. And I guess that that didn't happen. But that didn't happen. No. Yeah. So, uh, but I, what uh, I want to, no, go ahead. Uh, I started hanging out with Ron and Russell mm-hmm. 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 and, uh, in New York. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we had, we had Sal. Yeah. So and, how uh, did you guys get Sal? What was that like? Did that, how, how did that happen? That, that's a good question. Yeah, cause I, I want to ask know. you about that because like, cause I've, I've read a lot of interviews with you and you have said on several occasions that Sal was one of the best, maybe the best bass players you've ever worked with. And you guys had like the simpatico. Yes. The two best bass players I ever jive with mm. and like rolled thunder with. Is Sal Meda and mm. Roger C. Real, mm. and uh, uh, that uh, that's a whole other story, the yep. Roger C. Real thing, because uh, I did his first record with G. E. Smith. Oh wow! And uh, at the at the time, I was looking for other members for the Mick Ronson band. I was also uh, 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 playing with Dan Hartman. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. And uh, doing sessions in New York. And uh, Mick Mick got me a gig with John Cougar. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, From his uh, first record. Right. And, uh, but uh, Sal suggested Jeff Salen. Yeah. uh, To to play guitar on uh, Big Beat. Right. Yeah, yeah. To take Mick Ronson's place. Right, 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 right. And yeah. so we rent the uh, rehearsal room, mm-hmm. and uh, Jeff, it's me, Jeff Salen, Ron, and Russell. Yeah. And we're waiting for Rupert Holmes right. to show up. <laughs> and we're waiting. Uh-huh. And he's a half hour late. Okay. And he's an hour late. Okay. And. Ron and Russell are getting really, really agitated at this right. point. Like, man, <laughs> where the hell is this guy? The Rupert finally opens up the door with a bouquet of roses <laughs> and a box of chocolate <laughs> and hands them to Ron and Russell and apologizes <laughs> for being late and says, let's hear the music. <laughs> and he sits, uh-huh. uh, uh, at the back of the room, yeah, in front of my drum set, uh-huh. about twenty feet, yeah. twenty feet away from my drums, right. Sal is on my left, uh, Jeff Salen's on my right. Yes, Ron is uh, uh, back where Rupert is, and Russell I mean, is just you know, yeah. dancing around singing <laughs> like he does. And yeah. we're we're playing what we had been rehearsing yes for a few days before be, before Rupert got there i see yeah and during this time Rupert is staring at me why he is totally fixated why? on me I, I i i didn't know at the time <laughs> and then he gets up uh-huh. During one of the big beat songs, uh-huh. he gets up and he sits right on my drum riser mm. and puts his head right next mm. to my kick drum. Mm-hmm. And he says, okay, play another. Mm. Because song. Rupert wanted you to be the focus is what, what, what I come away with is that he wanted you to, to be the focus of the, of that album or you and Sal. Apparently. Because after a song or two, Rupert gets up and he looks at me and he goes, you are a slamming drummer. Uh. Holy cow. 
What a big sound, man. What a great backbeat you have. <laughs> and Ron and Russell, yeah. uh, they loved it. They were smiling. Good. Like, yeah, that's right. And he's in the band. Yeah. And so... Uh, how were uh, how, how were those sessions? Did, did did it feel comfortable? Was it like weird? Was it tense? Like how were those uh, recording sessions for for Big Beat? Oh, they the, they were like easy peasy. Yeah, I had this monster black, uh, very John Bonham kind of sounding drum kit, dude. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you go back and yeah. listen to Big Beat now; it's like thunderous. Yes. <laughs> it was so much fun playing yeah. with Ron and Russell and hanging out with Ron and Russell in New York because none of us drank, none of yeah. us caroused right. around at night. And, you know, uh, so uh, it was uh, in the studio, it was mm. like Rupert gave amazing production ideas. So do you think he did a good job, Rupert? Do you think he knew what he was doing and he did a good job? He, he, he pointed you guys in the right direction? What, what's your take on that? My take on it yeah. is I think uh, Rupert did uh, uh, considering what the uh, the flavor mm. of yeah. this new wave of music coming yeah. together. I think Rupert did a great job. Mm. Now, if you ask me if I had a chance to mix that record yeah. myself, would it sound a hundred times better? I would tell you yes. <laughs> so you think like in, in the mixing and the mastering, maybe things didn't go the way you, you know, thought they should have gone. Well, during the first song, we're, we're listening point. in the, in the uh, control room. Yeah. And me and Sal, about 20 seconds into song one, look at one another. Yeah. And we kind of shrug our shoulders mm -hmm. and go, what kind of sound is this? Hmm, 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 hmm. That's weird. We didn't sound like this. Yeah. Uh, in in the big church, empty church oh, room. Right. That's where you guys, yeah, did all that stuff. Yeah. When, when I listen to the record, like what stands out to me is you and Sal. You and Sal. That's what I'm hearing. Like that's the focus to me, and I think that, uh, yeah, to my ears, that works really well. I mean, not everyone like loves that record. I'm a huge fan. But I'd also like to ask you how you felt about the tour afterward. The tour was so bizarre. You, had, you have no idea how bizarre that tour was. <laughs> it was like a Fellini-esque type <laughs> of tour. Our first gig was opening for the band Boss Yes. In their hometown. <laughs> and then we were opening for, for other super bands that were not in the genre uh, of, you know, not on the yeah. same. We, we, we were opening up on yeah. the same bill uh, with bands that had nothing to do with. Right. By the, the way, spark sound. Can, we, that's, can that's we talk about Patty Smith? Credit. Can we talk about Patty Smith? What was that like? That was that. <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah, I figured. Patty's, I knew her backup band yeah. from the uh, Cherry Vanilla days. Uh -huh. And uh, I was friendly with uh, one or two members of her band, but it was like we would uh, alternate who would open up mm -hmm. based on record sales, who had the stronger <laughs> market in any particular city. 
Mm-hmm. Did you get but hit? They were very difficult. I got to say, they were really difficult to work with. Didn't you get hit on the head Although at one I point? I admire Patty Smith now more than uh, I ever gave her credit for. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think her, her, her record, uh, had it not been for their kind of like standoffish, mm kind of like attitude sure. to us, like denying us a sound check. Oh, wow. Uh, being Did, kind of bossy. Uh, so do, do you mean like Patti Smith personally? Was she bossy? Was she like difficult? No, she, her, the, her, her road manager, okay. I think. Yeah. And we, we didn't appreciate it much, yeah. but sometimes... We would open up for her, and we would get three encores. Oh, wow. 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 And a couple of times, Patty Smith was so rattled <laughs> that people were still stomping for Sparks for us to come back on stage that she... she she waited like 20 <laughs> minutes be- before going on stage because people were just screaming, we want sparks, we want sparks, we want sparks. <laughs> Hilly, I read that you got hit in the head with a beer bottle. Is that right? Yeah, right Right at the end of Big Boy, <laughs> our last song, Yeah, something cracks. <laughs> Cracks me right above my eyelid, uh, and I'm doing a cymbal swish to end Big Boy and end the set. Yeah, and I feel all this warm liquid <laughs> oh my dripping down my face. Right, but I can't see. It's dark. <laughs> Fuck. And Russell turns around and he looks at me. And he has this look of shock and horror. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, why is he giving me, why is he, why is Russell looking at me that way? And then, bam, the lights go on. I look down, my entire snare drum was full of blood. Oh, shit. I'm a bloody, it, it looked, it looked like oh. I came, came out of a, a uh, an ex murder movie or something. <laughs> oh god! I had to go to the hospital. I had to get stitches. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. I don't know who the bottle was intended yeah. to hit, <laughs> but it it. I have a scar above my still? eye. Still, I see every morning. Still? It's I wear it as a badge of honor. Oh wow, dude. So, so when when that when the tour ended, what happened after that? Like, tour is over. What did Ron and Russ say to you? Okay, we're in L.A. Our last gig at New Year's Eve at the Santa Monica Civic. Mm-hmm. Some band called Van Halen is opening, and Heard then Flo and Eddie mm-hmm. are next. And then we are the headliners, mm. and Russell comes out wearing a big diaper <laughs> for our New Year's Eve bash uh-huh. at the Santa Monica Civic. <laughs> okay. We end the show. It was an amazing show. Yeah. We end the show, and we're just <laughs> waiting for what, what are we going to do? Uh-huh. The yeah. record is not taking off. Right. So uh, Sparks Management had me, Jimmy McAllister, and Selmeda um, in motel or hotel rooms. Mm. And we were doing nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Mm. Uh, and we were wondering what our fate was going to be. Right. And uh, uh, this went on for about a month. Mm. After the tour ended. Yeah, the entire month of January, we mm. were just 
doing nothing. Right. Uh, I'd go out on the town with Ron and Russell. Hmm. Maybe the three of us would go to the movies, see yep. some old, in, 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 sorry, <laughs> Ingmar Bergman. Oh, well, of course. They love Ingmar Bergman, yeah. Yeah, and Ron, Ronnie and Russell turned me on to so much cool, cool, yeah. really uh, yeah. normal, <laughs> uh, not opposite the rock and roll, yeah, kind of like crazy yeah. people, you know, so wild parties, girls. Orgies. Yeah, I mean, and, they're not like, like they're not like that, right? Like they they don't really go in for all those kind of rock and no, roll shit, right? They they are clean cut, yeah, and a joy to be hanging out with. Yeah, Russell is really funny. Ronnie is really funny, <laughs> and uh, we would do the most. Uh, I don't know. Some people would think it was weird, but yeah. you know, Ron, yeah. Ronnie would pick pick us up in uh, his uh, Volkswagen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, bug, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, we we would go to like uh, nickel and dime stores. Sure, and Ron and Russell would would be buying like dollar. Trinkets. And <laughs> oh yeah, they love little knickknacks and shit, don't they? Yeah, yeah, and we we would hang out at farmers market and just bask in the sunlight and uh, sit outside and watch all the tourists, hundreds of tourists, and we go there almost like every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big thing. I took away from that is Ron and Russell, their, 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 their most favorite thing at that time was <laughs> to order a bagel. Oh, okay. A fresh bagel <laughs> with a side of ricotta uh, cheese uh -huh. and an iced tea. Okay. And we would sit there and chitty chat uh -huh. about whatever <laughs> and peel the bagel skin all the skin off comes the off the doughy part and put ricotta cheese inside and that was the coolest <laughs> thing in the world to me so you ate and, only, just the skin right is that is that what i'm hearing yeah just the yeah skin. okay and that was the thing oh wow it was it was almost like a like a competition <laughs> who, who could leave the most perfect looking bagel <laughs> Without destroying too much of the, the dough under the skin. <laughs> <laughs> so Hilly, when 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 they let you go, what was that like? Well, a couple of weeks before uh, we were told uh, the party's over, mm -hmm. I picked up a guitar with Jimmy in my room. Yeah, and. I said, give me, give me that acoustic. And I started writing songs. Ah, and is that when you like wrote stuff like, um, calling, calling all, girls, all girls, right? Yeah. yeah. And I said, let's, let's make the most commercial <laughs> bubble gum, happy tongue in cheek, <laughs> kind of record yeah. we can yeah so i was writing songs yeah every day yeah. with jimmy and then stockpiling songs and then word came down yeah. uh look uh ron and russell uh, uh they decided to uh d disband the band as they do uh, Millie and jimmy uh uh, it was all, you know, friendly. Yeah. Yeah. And stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And, sure. uh, uh, we left, uh, Hollywood and, uh, 
we came back home. Mm -hmm. And uh, home, home meaning Connecticut or what, what, what? yeah, New Haven. New Haven. Okay. I I I went to New Haven. Jimmy went back to his uh, his uh, loft mm -hmm. in New York. Okay. He had a roommate, a drummer friend, mm -hmm. but uh, and I would like you know f go to New York four or five times a week. Mm -hmm. And crash on the couch mm -hmm. at, with Jim and hang out with Jimmy. And uh, my brother-in-law here in New Haven mm -hmm. had a recording studio. Mm -hmm. And I was bringing Jimmy in from New York and compiling demo after demo after demo after demo. <laughs> and... Uh, me, Sal, and Jimmy. Oh, oh still with oh, Sal. Sal finally ended up coming back. Cool. Because uh, Ron and Russell, I think, kept Sal out there. Mm. They, they they had planned to to keep Sal, mm. but then changed their mind. Right. <clears throat> and uh, I had crafted three of maybe 20 songs I had written. Right. And, and did most of those end up, up on your uh, your first uh, record, Calling All Girls? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I selected three of my best songs, called up Rupert, mm -hmm. rehearsed in New York at Mix Brownstone. Yeah. Oh, okay, and okay cool. And uh, we we did Gemini, calling all girls, mm -hmm. and an, a song called "Up She Goes Down" that no uh, one's heard. I I, but, I don't know uh, about I'm it. I'm on getting it heard soon. It is super great. Yeah, yeah. So I'm back for a month or two. Yeah. And I say to Jimmy, mm. Jimmy, I'm going to call Rupert. And ask him uh, uh, to uh, produce us. Okay. What did what what did Rupert say? Rupert Rupert was really hard to pin down, mm. but mm. I finally mm. wore him down with phone mm. calls, and I had written about twenty tunes mm. Mm. with my cousin. His name is Kip Saginaw. <laughs> my cousin wrote the bulk of the lyrics mm. for uh, Calling All Girls. Mm -hmm. I had the title. I had the first verse. Yeah. Uh, and then Kippy, my cousin, would finish it up. Yeah. And uh, me and Kip wrote uh, Calling All Girls, Teenage Days, mm. Gemini, mm. uh so I, I, I want to talk uh, to you about some of those uh, those songs, especially Calling All Girls. I mean, you got a lot of play on MTV. You had a video that, like, was being played all the time back, you know, when it was coming out. Like, you know, did, did you feel like your career was reaching an, another level when Calling All Girls was being played on M MTV all the time? Well... I uh, released the record, mm -hmm. and I pick up a Billboard magazine, mm. and uh, MTV wasn't even in existence yet. <laughs> and I'm walking down, you know, Third Avenue or something, reading Billboard, and it said. A little article. It said Hilly Michaels has won the award for best foreign rock video at best. the Medem Music Conference mm. in uh, con in uh, France. Wow! 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 And I cool. called up my manager and I said, "Did, did you know that <laughs> I, 
I just won an award for having the best video foreign rock video in the world. From, you from said Europe foreign foreign kidding. rock video. Is that what you said? Foreign. Uh, what's this? I'm sorry. I, I thought you said foreign rock video. I'm sorry. Yeah, foreign. Uh, okay, so that's what. It, even though you're a guy in, uh, I guess at California in California at that time. Uh, no, this is. Uh, I'm in New York. Ah, uh, New York. Okay. And gotcha. uh, me dem is happens every year mm. in the south mm. of France, mm. ah. where all the the big shot record company people ah, and publishers get together yeah. and wheel and deal and uh, you know meet. Yeah. yeah. So they um, heard. They they saw my video, yeah, and it was their very first me them music uh, conference. Mm. Since then, it's become like you know uh, an established, yeah. uh, iconic kind of like yeah. uh, thing that happens once a year for about a week. Everyone flies to me them and they go to uh to, to make uh, re recording deals and publishing mm. deals mm. you had roy thomas baker producing that first album of yours is that right yes how, how did that yes. come about because you know he was, he was a big name even then well let me let me be honest here Mm -hmm. My first choice was Michael Chapman mm -hmm. from Chinny Chab. Mm -hmm. He was the number one singles producer in the world. Mm -hmm. And my, my manager at the time, Jay Cooker, had... Uh, Rupert started the, the production on these demos. Mm. Dan Hartman mm. helped me finish them up at his studio in Westport, Connecticut. And uh, uh, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Roy Thomas Baker. Yeah, Roy Thomas I'm Baker. I'm playing with uh, Ian, uh, Ian Hunter and Mick Ronson. Ah. Hunter Ronson tour. Gotcha. Doing uh, you're Never Alone with the right. Schizophrenic. Uh, yeah. yeah. Supporting that live. I'm, I'm on tour yeah. with uh, uh, Mick and Ian, and uh, Jake Hooker calls me up and he said, I just got you a um, a wor worldwide recording contract with Warner Brothers. Yeah. Isn't that great? And I said, no, I don't want it. Really? I don't want the record deal. Really? I'm happy. I'm happy doing this. Mm. Mm. And he said, Hilly, Roy Thomas Baker heard it as well. He yeah. wants to produce you. That's big. The cars had just come out. Yeah. And and he did Queen, right? Like, you know, he, he was a big... Roy Thomas Baker. Yeah. Journey. Yeah. Yes. Queen. Yeah. Alice Cooper. Yeah. And that was a good-sounding record, by the way, if I may say. That was a very good-sounding record of yours. Who? Yeah, you know something? It's uh, like a, it's like a bottle of wine. <laughs> yeah, it's getting better and better. Yeah. No, I think so. And it's it's holding up. It's holding up. I think it is. I really, uh, I really do. So, uh, I, I wanted to ask you. I know we've been going on for quite a long time, but you know, I, I I just want to ask you because you've worked with so many big names. I, I would just I, I I want to pick your brain and see if you could just tell me in like a word or two what it was like working with some of these people like um say Mick Ronson. 
one of the best uh, experiences I ever had in my life mm. was living and playing with someone who I adored and worshipped at the same time and and just je uh, je gelled mm. with. Okay. Uh, Nick and I had a very, very unique, special friendship. Nice. And uh, I miss him tremendously. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm so sad that he's not here. Mm. Yeah. Uh, he helped me uh, with my second batch of demos. Mm -hmm. he, he helped me produce my second batch of demos before I physically signed my Warner Brothers contract. Yeah. He would do anything for me, and I would do anything for Mick. That's the kind of relationship we had, and we would share new music discoveries with one, one another. Oh, that's great. Okay, I've got a few more names on my list. Uh, Michael Bolton. Michael uh, was uh, uh, Michael was uh, kind of very quiet and mm -hmm. very uh, maybe uh, overly paranoid about stuff. And, uh, uh, was kind of, uh, it was kind of, uh, I kind of felt pressured playing with Michael. It wasn't nearly as fun playing with Michael as it was playing with Dan Hartman, uh, or Mick or Sparks or, uh, Ian Hunter. Uh, he was, uh, he was really, I grew, I, we grew up together in the oh, same wow. hometown. Yeah. Like, oh, that's yeah. right. You guys were like kids together, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah I, we met yeah. on the, uh, little league baseball team. <laughs> wow. And I remember wearing my baseball <laughs> uniform. Uh -huh. Running out into the field, yeah. I took out a pack of Trident gum <laughs> and had just come out. And I said, Hey, Mike, you want a piece of gum? And he said, Don't mind if I do. Thanks. <laughs> Word. Okay. That's great. All right. I got, I, I, I got a few more. Uh, John Mellencamp. John was, uh, he, he was, uh, <laughs> he came over to the same loft that Mick, uh, was living in. Mm. And I, I was also, you know, living in. Mm. And, uh, right, right before, uh, about a month or two before Spark shows up, mm. Mellencamp shows up <laughs> and he's, he's, uh, Dressed in tight black boots, uh -huh. tight leather <laughs> pants, uh, black uh, leather pants, yeah, leather tight leather <laughs> black leather shirt. His hair all slicked back, yeah. and he's cursing <laughs> at Ronson at Mick. Oh yeah, yeah. He's he's like disrespecting Mick. Oh wow. To a point where Mick is just laughing. <laughs> you know, F you, Mick. And, 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 and I'm sitting there listening. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, my God. How can he be talking to Mick like this? But Mick, it didn't bother Mick. Yeah. It didn't right. bother Mick at all. That's and cool. uh, Mellencamp said, listen, uh, 
we're 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 uh, uh, starting my record <laughs> next week. He goes, I got my bass player, uh-huh. and uh, I want you to play gu- guitar. He, he says, do you, do you know of any good drummers? Uh-huh. And Mick points at me. He says, Yeah, mine. Yeah. Hilly. Yeah. This is Hilly Michael. He's my drummer. And uh, a week later, we're in the studio, and I'm sitting there, and Michael Kamen is on keyboards, mm-hmm. and there's Mick Ronson and mm-hmm. this guy John Cougar, mm-hmm. and lots of lots. Of People from Main Man Records mm. were floating in and out, mm. and I was so nervous playing on Chestnut Street sure. incident, sure. whatever it's called. Yeah, uh, I'm going to give you two I more. Was oh, so I'm sorry. Nervous. You had more. I I was so nervous. Yeah. We ran the song down. Yeah. Got our sounds, and after they got the drum sound, they had to get sounds for the bass and the guitars. Well, I was so I was trembling with fear, <laughs> so I ran out of the studio into the street, mm-hmm. into the nearest liquor store, <laughs> bought a bottle of red wine, <laughs> opened it. And guzzled half the <laughs> bottle down <laughs> to calm down my nerves. I couldn't believe the company I was surrounded by. I can relate. People from, a lot of people from Dylan, Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder tour yeah. was there. His <laughs> fiddle, his violinist, their fiddleist, his fiddleist. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I can't remember. I can't re- remember his name, but uh, he's legendary. Uh, and I, Michael Kamen, uh-huh. who went on to, to become a, a Grammy Award-winning uh, motion picture uh, composer uh, arranger, was playing keyboards, yeah. and he loved me. As a, uh, a oh, drummer. Really? Oh, really? And uh, uh, he made me feel comfortable. So did and, you get uh, to work on any movie uh, soundtracks? Or like, did, uh, did, did, did you get any work out of, out of that? Uh, from what? Oh, sorry. I, uh, yeah, never mind. From, from the John Cougar thing? No, 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 no. The the guy who was uh, the 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 director of movies. Oh well, after you know, during or after calling all, all girls was made. John Peters, who had uh, done uh, maybe uh, Animal House, yeah. was. He yeah. called up my manager and he, he said, does Hilly have any song that would be appropriate for the, uh, the, uh, duty in the pool scene? Oh, that's how you got your song in Caddyshack. So they sent me an uncut version of, uh, of Caddyshack. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And they yeah. said, we, we want you to write. A do du- a, a song a duet for Chevy yeah. and Bill Murray to yeah. sing together like <laughs> Bing Crosby. They asked Bing you Bob Hope. to write a duet for Chevy Chase and Bill Murray. Uh yes, that's okay. That's pretty so cool. I wrote it with Martin Briley. Mm-hmm. It was called Caddyshack. Yeah, and uh, submitted it. And uh, it was a perfect Bing Crosby, Bob Hope kind of like, you know, trade off of vocals. Right. right. And with a very infectious uh, chorus. Yeah. Yeah. With uh, a Caddyshack in there. They they send me uh, an uncut. 
version of the movie with no music in there at right. all. No soundtrack at all. <laughs> and uh, they said, I'm, I'm sitting there watching the duty in the pool scene. <laughs> they said, we want something for for that scene <laughs> so as they well. Were, they leaned on you to write music for the the duty in the pool scene. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they were all over me. <laughs> that's, uh, that's that's. They right. wanted me first to write, you know, the theme <laughs> song for the movie Caddyshack, and then uh, uh, they heard my record. Mm. And they mm. said, "Never mind. Oh, we're, get out of here. We're gonna, we're gonna use something else Ow. for the duty in the pool scene, which okay. of course was the Jaws scene." Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. right. But, you, but you did and ultimately get one of your songs in the movie, right? What's that? You did ultimately uh, ultimately get one of your songs in that movie. Right. Yeah, during uh, the classic uh, Rodney Dangerfield stealing uh, uh, the yacht, yeah, and crashing into other boats and people, and crashing crashing it into the dock, right, and right. The anchor coming down, and yeah, they ended up using a song I had written, yeah, uh, paying homage to Sparks. <laughs> called something on your mind. Oh, that was an homage to Sparks. Okay, that's cool. I, I can see. Yes, that. yes. I was trying to to imitate Russell. Mm. That's a, that's that always always a tough job there. So you you did another record. I remember. Go ahead. I I remember doing the vocals, Christian. Yeah. yeah. And Roy Roy Baker is I'm I'm singing something on your mind like Russell. Yeah, this is how you make it. You know, yeah, you're you're getting up there and that full set and stuff. Oh. Roy is saying, well, "Why are you singing? Why are you singing like that?" <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that Roy. I mean, he's worked with Queen too, right? Like, you know, he he knows what it's like to work with singers that go way up there in the falsetto. That's funny. So Roy uh, is. Go ahead. An amazing engineer. Roy? But Roy is one of the world's best engineers. Yeah. In terms of producing a solo artist yeah. that does not have or has not been part of a band yeah. that has... Uh, um, that hasn't developed their own sound, my like journey. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that's great that, that you had, that you had Roy. Queen. Means. Queen, yes. Of course. You know who produced Queen? I mean, I know Roy did for at least a couple albums. Queen produced Queen. Roy didn't do uh, Night at the Opera? Well, his name is, is listed as <laughs> producer. Right, yeah, right. But I I know how Roy works in yeah. the uh, studio. Right. His, his gift is putting 27 mics on, on a set of drums, getting godlike sounds. Yeah. For guitars and bass yeah. and vocals and stuff like that, yeah. but uh, I think most of those bands. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, can you name me an artist, a solo artist that didn't have his own band for he was using for two or three years? Mm -hmm that Roy produced. No, I don't think so. Other than myself. Right. There are no other solo artists, Roy Baker. Wow. So you're like the only one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, the other, the other cool, 
Yeah. Go ahead. Of, uh, I mean, Roy, Roy does have amazing ears. I mean, I can't take that away from him. I mean, the guy's got to be talented. I mean, he's produced so much great stuff. Yeah. And it's how you define produce. Mm, right. Right, 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 right. Did he produce a good vibe? Mm, right. Did he produce <laughs> some great champagne every yeah. day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got gotcha. you. Bring it to the studio and, and made everyone yeah. feel comfortable. <laughs> yeah. The word producer has so many connotations right. to it. It's Yeah, and I know that's very stretchy. Like, you know, like different producers do different things and they're like, you know, like who knows? Like you could be like a Brian Eno and be, you know, all over everything. Um, I would love to have an opportunity to remix my my first record. Oh, really? All Is that right? And I would love to have the opportunity to remix uh, Lumia. Okay. So I wanted to ask you about that, too, because you took a long break from your own music after Lumia, and you, you didn't come back to doing any recording until 2010, when you did, when you did, uh, uh, what was that? Uh, pop, pop, pop this, right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. you rehashed, redid some of those older songs of yours. So what, what motivated you at that time to revisit those songs of yours and to make a new record? Oh, I was, uh, on the road running marketing uh, call centers mm -hmm. for uh, the, our country's most prestigious uh, symphony orchestras, mm -hmm. ballet companies, uh, operas, musical theaters. And for eight or nine years, I was hiring uh, uh, people to call hundreds of thousands of people for, let's say, the Detroit Opera. Mm. Mm. And I would have a nine-month campaign mm. where I would have two shifts of 15 people every day and Saturday. And I had to hire people, teach them how to call mm. our patron base and fill up, meaning call our past <laughs> patrons mm -hmm. whose information I would pass out to, to certain callers and uh, teach them mm. to purchase the upcoming season mm. and sell out the venue. Mm -hmm. For the uh, Detroit Opera, the Detroit Symphony, mm -hmm. the Cleveland Opera House, the mm -hmm. Cleveland Symphony, uh, Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. I was head of the marketing, the call center, mm -hmm. where I would hire people who only wanted to work part time. Yeah. Four hours a day. Yeah. And so I had two four hour shifts yeah. of different people every day. And I did so, I raised millions and millions of dollars for wow. the fine arts. Wow. And I did that for eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. And in 2009, I was working at the uh, Detroit Symphony. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got a fan email, an email from a Hilly fan mm -hmm. from Norway, Julie, <laughs> uh, her name is Julie. Uh -huh. uh, she said, where are you? Please come back and make yeah. more music. 
I love calling all girls. Yeah. You have so many people out there that love your music. Why did you stop? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I quit my gig yeah. as uh, a market uh, marketer, uh-huh. you know, running call centers. Yeah. And, uh, hey, listen, Christian. Yeah. I was, I was promoting... For example, uh, ticket sales for the Kiev Ballet okay. and the Bolshoi Ballet oh, wow. coming to America nice. okay. and uh, being on the uh, program. So yeah. I loved doing that gig. Yeah. I, would, I would work my ass off for nine months. Saturdays and Sundays and just work every morning, afternoon and evening, get home at 10 and do it all over again. The yeah. following days, each campaign was nine months Wow! and I had a three month downtime where I would fly to Maui mm. and just hang out in Hawaii right? in between gigs. Yeah. And that that was uh, that was my life for ten years. Mm-hmm. Are you still? I loved it. Are you still in love with, with music? Are you still in love with drumming? Yes. And here is the, the best news. Mm-hmm. Finally, I'm going to be working. I've been waiting five years to do this. Yeah. I'm going to be, I've been invited to a home studio mm. with an excellent engineer and guitarist by the, by the name of Al Pagano. Okay. Uh, another multi-instrumentalist <laughs> called Danny Majori and myself, and they are opening up their studio and giving me carte blanche. Oh, wow. And I am preparing. So are you going to record more? Or are you, are you planning to record? Where? Uh, are you planning to record? Sorry to put you on the yes. spot. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got like 50, 50 yeah. great. 60 songs or pieces. Oh, man, that's songs. great. Oh, that's great to hear. That's And I am so excited and thrilled that I'm doing this. I'm going to make Pop This sound <laughs> like... Oh, that was uh, good. I really I really appreciated Pop This. That, that was a yeah, 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 really yeah. good sort of reinventing the wheel there. Uh, <laughs> this, yeah. this is going to be Hilly Michaels material <laughs> yeah. that nobody will associate. Yeah, 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 yeah. With me. Well, they're cool. gonna hear. It, they're gonna go. That's Hilly Michaels. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm yeah. planning to do a fourth solo record. Yeah, I'm really happy about it. Good. And uh, I begin next week oh gosh that's so exciting i i can't wait to to hear what comes out of that we got oh one... it's gonna be great it's gonna be great i'm gonna cut one track yeah and then put it on the internet and see what kind of feedback i get uh, hell yeah I'll, I'll 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 be there man and uh i'm sure i would be, i'm betting my life that it's going to come out amazing. Well, you picked a good time for this too. You know, I mean, all the sparks oh, the COVID stuff. Go, well, yeah, COVID, but all the, there's, you know, this whole interest in sparks and people related to sparks right now because of this, you know, the documentary. And that was the last thing I was going to ask, ask, uh, ask you about, or uh, I haven't seen it. Uh, were you interviewed in that thing? Oh yeah. Yeah. The, they interviewed me. Uh, they, they went through two clips. 
mm -hmm. of camera footage on me. And Edgar Wright, the, the director, mm -hmm. interviewed me for about an hour and a half. Yeah. He loved my stories. <laughs> That's great. About uh, I can't wait to see it. So I'm in the trailer. Yeah. You, and I'm in, I'm definitely in the, uh, uh, the, the documentary. Yeah. At the end of the uh, interview, the uh, movie uh, director, Edgar Wright, comes over to me and he says, Hilly, right. I'm, I'm being honest with you here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Big Beat is my favorite Sparks album. Really? <laughs> well, I mean, it's definitely the best Sparks album that you've been a part of, without a doubt. <laughs> but but it, it's a good record. <laughs> I, I mean, don't know how, you know how to answer that. Big beat. I don't, I don't want to go like crazy on this topic, but big big beat to me has always been your record. It, maybe maybe Sal also, but to me, when I hear that record, it's all about you and Sal. You guys it's, make that record. What it is? It's it. it, 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 it. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, and it's almost like they're saying, "Listen to the drums yeah. on this one," right? Which I am so uh, humbled by, yeah, and uh, uh, gracious about. Uh, I can't believe they called it Big B. <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, I mean, how? Do you take that? Yeah. So I was very flattered, very moved. Yeah. And I love Ron. And I love Russell. Yeah. And I love their publicist, uh, Madeline Bacar. Oh, yeah, Madeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's, she's great. I've talked to her. Yeah, yeah. She turns me on to, to so much new, cool music yeah. every day. She sends me from her personal collection mm. of uh, goodies. <laughs> and uh, I have, I've known her for like 30 years. Oh, wow, really? The past six months, we've become so, so friendly. Oh, wow. She's cool. That, that's great, man. Man, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm so excited that you're doing a new project and that you're in this documentary and things are still happening because I really appreciate the work that you've done in the, in the past. And I'm very happy that we got to talk tonight. Well, I really enjoyed it too, Christian. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, 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 asking me to do this. Yeah. And uh, b a big shout out to all my uh, friends. Who who are uh, all three. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Hey, listen, this new record I'm doing yeah. is gonna, it's gonna be the bomb. Oh man. Like, okay. I, I let's, let's keep in, uh, in touch. Cause I, I, I really want to hear what you're doing with the new stuff. You're not going to believe it. Yeah. I would love to definitely. All right. Hilly, I'm, I'm going to okay. let you go, man. It's been a great, right. great evening. I All really right, appreciate Christian. talking to you. I have a fantasy that I can't understand. Drifting and dreaming that I'm in another land. Where the light goes play in Cossacks that all day Russian. Russian, Russian, Russian girls like you. I've traveled very far to meet a commissar. What's it like to be a Soviet baby? Sipping a vodka on a chilly afternoon. Drinking with comrades in the Baltic Sea Saloon. Working in a factory. From six till half past three Russian, Russian, Russian 
Rushing girls like you You can pronounce your name But I like you just the same And what's it like to be A Soviet lady From different worlds so far apart Please tell me if there is a way to reach your heart Let's go.